Dr. Pryor here and I wanted to make this video because we have this problem with COVID-19 and mental health and so I invited my friend here. She and I went to naturopathic school so we're very close and she's a great doctor and so I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you Sam, that was very nice of you. Um, my name is Dr. Abraham. Most of my patients call me Dr. Angel. Um, you don't have to though. And this is my white coat, which indicates that I am a doctor. In fact, um, I graduated with Sam and I'm currently practicing at Placeris Naturopathic in New Milford in Connecticut, New Milford, Connecticut. And if you want to schedule an appointment, you can with the front desk and I am cash pay only for now, but I will soon be able to take New York and Connecticut insurance. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So yeah, I just wanted to point out we are both naturopathic doctors and I read or actually saw this study from the World Naturopathic Foundation that there are only 8,000 practicing naturopaths in the whole United States. So you are so lucky because you are getting two of us. That's right, two. <laughs> so yeah. So. I read a study and I'm just going to read it out loud for you because it is a fascinating study. So here it goes. A new study suggests that one third of COVID-19 survivors have long-term mental health or neurological symptoms, which some have referred to as a brain disease. Here's what the study says. So it was published in the medical journal Lancet Psychiatry, and they found that 24% of COVID-19 survivors were diagnosed with neurological or psychological conditions within six months of infections. The most reported symptom among the COVID-19 survivors was anxiety, which impacted 17% of patients in the study, which reviewed health records for more than 236,000 COVID-19 patients. And mood disorders were the second on the list of most reported symptoms at 14%. So fascinating. And I have a few people. My friend here, she had COVID-19. Another one of the students I worked with who just graduated as a naturopathic doctor this year, she had COVID and she reported to me that yes, she felt more anxious after she had the virus. So it is a very common uh, phenomenon. So we're gonna just talk about it. What do you think about it? Well, it, it said in another part of the article that most of these patients hadn't been hospitalized for COVID. So it doesn't have to be a very severe case of COVID for them to be struggling, for people who had have who have had COVID to be struggling with this brain disease or neurological issues. Um, I mean, that's very interesting to me because we assume that if you weren't in the hospital and you weren't, you know, away from your family and things like that, if it wasn't very severe, there's no reason to be upset about things. But I mean, it's a very difficult disease. People are scared. And I can imagine that that emotional component has something to do with it. And there has to be a physical component too, that we're just, we're not really sure what it is yet, but there must be something going on. Yeah. And I would like to say that we know uh, that the COVID-19 does affect your nerves, because if you look at the symptoms, what was that number one symptom? They would always tell you if you have this, you didn't get a common cold, you had COVID. And mm -hmm. what was it? Loss of smell, mm -hmm. right? And so that loss of smell is your olfactory nerve and it sits right up here on a bone, but it is in the central nervous system and it has little projections that come out of the bone. And so they sit here and they sense all the input from your nose, right? But when that whole nerve is affected, that is your central nervous system. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the brain stem and the brain stem is where your emotional brain sits, which is, you know, your limbic system. And so it makes total sense why if you have inflammation in this part of your brain, why you still have this 
lingering anxiety component, this lingering, um, you know, brain fog as they call it, headaches, uh, memory issues, all these sorts of things. It's basically an inflama inflammation going on that hasn't stopped yet. So, yeah, I think uh, what Angel and I, or Dr. Abraham and I, are going to just talk about our ways to help in this department. So, what is some ways you, you know, help your patients that are having anxiety and, you know, are dealing with brain fog issues? What's some of the things you might do? Well, I think a great place to start is just having your regular labs done. Is having a routine panel of labs done. Um, so much of what I've heard and seen work is just being with the patient, looking over these routine labs and making minor adjustments. Like sometimes people's vitamin D are, is so low that it's almost incredible that no one's recommended vitamin D to them before. They'll come in for yes. something like skin issue or um, like having a little bit more anxiety than usual. And when you correct that vitamin D issue, things can exponentially just change. Yes, and that's a really good point because in routine labs, they do not uh, check vitamin D. Uh, believe it or not, insurance don't even check, don't even pay for vitamin D to be checked. So, you know, it is an out of pocket expense, but I would say if you don't have this lab ran, you do need to ask your doctor for it because vitamin D is so important. As she's saying, when you're low, you will have manifestations in the skin, in your mood, in your immune system. You, We know now people with low vitamin D they suffered the worst with COVID-19. These were most people that died, had a super low vitamin D. So vitamin D is super important. So wow. sorry to interject. Go ahead. No, that's okay. That's That story is a real story. Dr. Placeris just told me the story yesterday. Yes. And it's um, it was so interesting because she was also, Dr. Placeris is the um, doctor I work with. It's her clinic that I work at. Um, she was just astounded by this, that she corrected this one little thing and so many things cleared up. And that was found on a routine lab that she was running. So definitely the first step I think in dealing with post COVID symptoms is very much just having someone who has the time and the expertise in like how biochemistry works, especially um, to read your labs, look at unconventional labs sometimes. And sometimes it's just a matter of one or two less known labs that someone can really help you, especially naturopaths, because we get that education. Yes. Um, integrative doc functional medical professionals usually have that that training. So routine yeah. labs, I think that's We are step. not functional medicine doctors, though. They are no. not, they do not have the level of training we have. So please do not let them hoodwink you into thinking that there's a end all be all because they're not. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> the um, blood sugar issues we can catch on just routine labs that plays a part in mental health a lot because when you have high blood sugar this causes inflammation in the body mm -hmm. so we can catch something like that yeah so it's important to get your medical uh, attention because you know things could be underlying that are provoking this um, post COVID symptoms and we could catch them on labs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's huge. The other thing you want to consider is how interconnected symptoms can be. So things you may report to your physician, things like acne or, um, hair loss or sometimes bloating or indigestion, things like that. They're very connected to all other parts of our body. So what happens in the stomach, what happens in the GI can be a very potent indicator of what's happening in your brain and what's happening all over your nervous system. So one of the things that you may want to consider is getting into a discussion about what's going on with your GI tract. And your doctor should be asking about those things. What your bowel movements are like, what, what effect does food have on you? These are all important things to consider, especially because as me and Sam were talking about before, COVID-19 is very 
active in your gastrointestinal tract. Yes. Um, they've seen that fecal shedding of COVID-19 yes. virus far extends any symptoms you yes. may have. And it's spread through fecal oral. That's mm -hmm. how it spreads. So mm -hmm. we know it's in, it just populates your whole GI tract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the neurotransmitters we make in our stomach, actually, like, I think it's 90% of it. Yeah. Yeah. Is serotonin, which is a mood hormone. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And it's actually the, um, you have nerves in the GI tract that um, uptake this, but it's the bugs in the GI tract that make this. Um, the bugs make a lot of your neurotransmitters. So when those get off because you maybe had COVID-19 and so you basically had a war in your GI tract and these populations of these good bugs that make the serotonin get off, that could be a huge um, reason why you're having these mood disorders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one thing we as naturopaths check and that we do stool tests and we look at your bacteria and make sure they're balanced. And yeah, it's very important. Gut health plays a huge role in your overall health. We actually know now that if you miss one or two bugs, certain bugs in your gut, it can cause all chronic diseases. So it's very interconnected. But yes. anyway, so that was a very good point. Yes. And there's one more thing I wanted to mention, and that's that when my father got COVID, he went to an urgent care and what they gave him was azithromycin. So what I'm saying is that azithromycin is a antibiotic. It has it will have no effect on the on the COVID nineteen virus. It may if it was like if they were worried about a super infection, meaning an infection of the lungs, because of COVID nineteen, um, as like a natural effect of COVID nineteen, then that would have worked. But a lot of people are being recommended antibiotics without the proper medical advice to tell them that maybe an antibiotic isn't the right choice for them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I talked to a doctor who works in the ER, ex works exclusively with. COVID patients for a long time. And she said, I'm so astounded that urgent care doctors are still prescribing azithromycin for something that it won't work with, uh, yeah. won't work against. And antibiotics do have a very potent effect on killing all the bacteria in our gut, everything. It'll kill many, many, many things. It's very broad spectrum. So um, if you've taken an antibiotic for COVID, which you were which you were prescribed by a doctor, it would be probably a good idea to, if you're having still gut issues after that time, to get on a probiotic. I think, would you say that's good advice? Because yeah. some people don't like prescriptive advice, and I understand that. But you know, you don't have to get a pill probiotic. There's probiotics mm -hmm. that you eat. And so if you don't have these in your diet already, you should be adding these to your diet. And this is like sauerkraut, but not fermented. So making your own in your house is a wonderful practice. Um, this is kimchi. Yeah. And if you can do dairy, you can do a yogurt. Um, some people that can't do dairy if they're lactose intolerant can do a yogurt because mm -hmm. the bacteria ferment the lactose. But if you have a sensitivity to dairy, don't do yogurt. They do have new plant-based yogurts though. So you could do soy-based yogurt or almond milk-based yogurt. So there are other ones. But yeah, probiotics in your diet, good. <laughs> recommend highly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a double thumbs up. Yes. Um, two out of two doctor rec doctors recommend. Yes. Um, I also recommend if you're thinking about probiotics that they could easily access is also kombucha. Um, it's a little more expensive yeah. to buy per bottle, but if you're willing to get like a kombucha starter kit from Amazon, you can totally do it yourself. It's very, it's like a, just a process. Um, but kombucha is one of my favorite things. I want to start making kombucha now. Yes, <laughs> I think that's a good thing. idea. It's really cost effective to make. And um, I mean, I, I'm not a morning person, but kombucha has a little bit of black tea or green tea because it's tea based fermented yeah. drink. I will drink that in the morning and it's like a zip. Like it's like, yes. it's like wake up and I love it. So, I love kombucha yeah. too, man. Very yeah. good. So, so kombucha is a great, you know. And okay. Mm -hmm. And so 
There's one other thing we would like to talk about and that is mindfulness because meditation is so important, especially for anxiety. Yes, for anxiety, for the current climate that our world is in, I know that can be a very scary situation for many people. Um, things are happening all over the world. People are, you know, very much oppressed by a lot of things right now. and. There's, I've learned over the course of my life that the environment that we're in can impact us so much. And right now, it's not just the environment in our homes, it's our whole world can seem very daunting and scary. So um, I'm so glad we talked about the biophysical aspects of COVID-19 causing mood disorders and anxiety and all of these neurological sequelae. But one of the best things that we can do if it's not exactly neurological or maybe it's very low grade mindfulness can help kind of settle you and help you kind of develop coping strategies for anxiety for depression for regular nervous tension all of these things so um yeah and there's one study i have that I'm going to pull up real quick on meditation because it is very fantastic for your brain and they've actually seen it in um, study. So let me just pull it up real quick. You want me to talk about what my mindful, I should probably tell you what mindfulness yes. is. But so. let me just read this real quick. So meditation for patient and caregiver, and this is in people with dementia. And we're not saying you have dementia, but if you have neurological symptoms, you know, that is an inflammatory process in the brain, very similar to what happens in dementia. So here goes. Study shows increased gray matter volume in people who meditated, improves behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia, Meditation improves sleep, reduces anxiety and depression, upregulates immune system genes, downregulates inflammatory genes, improved genes that regulate insulin and glucose, and increase telomerase by 43%. So I am not going to go over what all that stuff means, but the main takeaway here is that it does reduce anxiety and depression, and it can help with brain matter so that is the main takeaways here and what we saw with covid is it does cause inflammation which did damage some of your brain tissue yeah so if you have this practice that can increase your brain tissue and reduce the symptoms of anxiety and depression yes let's bring it on <laughs> that's a good pitch for it because if i told you in 10 minutes in a day you could feel better, um, look better, be more, con have more control of your emotions, um, be more aware of yourself and interact better with the environment, um, have better mood, sleep, sex, whatever. Um, why wouldn't yes. you do that? Yes. So let's talk about what meditation can be and what mindfulness can be. So what, what forms of it have you used with patients? The, the one that I, personally do. And I was a newbie to meditation completely. And it's mindfulness meditation that I do um, when I came into it. So I started meditating, doing mindfulness meditation about, I want to say two and a half years ago. And I've done it pretty much every day for those two years. Um, so what it is, is a conscious awareness of your breath. That's a basic form of it. Um, we breathe every day, all the time. It's something that's going to stay with us until the moment that we pass. Um, so you can always access your breath. Um, so in mindfulness meditation, you very gently and compassionately, no matter what, what's happening in the mind, you just return to the feeling, the rise and the fall of your chest, the, the in and the out of your breath. And it just helps to train focus. So what this does is no matter how much our our mind is made to think so when we're out in the world and our brain is going usually what happens is we start to jump on every thought that comes by we're like thinking about this and that and this and it can lead to a lot of distraction which can also lead to a lot of anger 
or a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, because we feel overwhelmed by a lot of things. When we're doing mindfulness meditation, we learn how to not attach ourselves so readily to every thought. So we start to pick and choose. And in that way, we gain a, set more, a stronger sense of control over how we react to the environment, how we react to each other, the things that we say, the things that we do, it becomes a lot more measured and more conscious. So that's what mindfulness meditation, in essence, for me, um, what it does. Yeah, but there are many forms. I have a history of trauma and a lot of people with trauma do not feel comfortable sitting with themselves. So this is a practice I would say start on like if you have a history of trauma. Mm -hmm. But there's other ones. I do what's called a body scan mm -hmm. and basically it's a recorded person and she goes over the different parts of the body and she has me see if I have tension in these different parts of the body and really notice and feel the different parts of the body. That's a way you can do it. Very mm -hmm. fantastic, especially if you're someone who has chronic muscle pains mm -hmm. like in the neck or the TMJ because a lot of us hold our tension in these areas and being mindful and learning when you're doing it and having mindfulness of your body is very mm -hmm. healing. You can stop the process when you're doing it. There's also just actual mindfulness where you take something you're eating and you really notice what it tastes like and feel around in your mouth for sensation mm -hmm. and let your body smell it and look at it real intensely and this is something you can start with it's a very simple thing to do but profound because you're sitting with yourself and you're you know really being mindful and being in the moment so anytime you're focused on all these things that are bothering you and you're feeling anxious about and you're feeling all worked up and emotionally upregulated Go in your kitchen, grab you a strawberry, sit with it, look at the strawberry, you know, look at the beautiful seeds on it, look at the beautiful, you know, little leaves on it, smell it, you know, eat it, sit with it, and really focus on that strawberry, and that will take you out of that negative mood regulation and put you in the here and the now, and that is something very simple but profound you can do. So, yeah, mindfulness and meditation are wonderful practices. So, yeah, I think we've covered a lot. Um, if you are still dealing with COVID-19 symptoms and you've put these things into play and you're still not feeling better, make an appointment with, you know, Angel, Dr. Abraham, or me, Dr. Pryor. You can always reach out on my Instagram to get an appointment with me. But we thank you for joining us today for this talk. I hope you learned something. And yeah, you want to say anything? Um, no, that was great. Your Her des description of mindfulness was very good because you can turn anything into mindfulness. If, you're, if you have your full focus on this video right now, you might be mindfully watching this video, which is very cool. So yeah, that was everything. Thank you so All much right. for joining us. Yes. I hope you found some information useful, yeah. Yes, well, have a good night. Okay, and if you could sub sub subscribe to my channel, I would really thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.